In the days when the spinning wheels humed busily in the farmhouse and even great ladies clothed in silk and thread lace and their toy spinning wheels of polished oak three might be seen in districts far away among the lanes or deep in the bosom of the hills certain pallid and sized men who by the, the side of the browny country folk looked like the remnants of a de disinherited race the shepherd's dog backed fiercely when one of these alien looking men appeared on the upland dark against the early winter sunset or what dog likes a figure bent under a heavy da a heavy bag and these pale men rarely stirred abroad without that mysterious burden the shivered himself though he had good reason to be to believe that the bag held nothing but flaxen thread or else the long rolls of strong linen spun from that thread was not quite sure that this trade of weaving indispensable though it was could be carried on entirely without the help of the evil one in that part of time superstition clanged easily around every person or thing that was at all unwanted or even intermitted and occasional merely like the visits of the peddler or the knife grinder no one knew where wandering men had their homes or their origin and how was a man to be explained unless you at least knew somebody who knew his father and mother to the pe to the peasants of all times the world outside their own direct experience was a region of vagueness and mystery to the and troubled thought a state of wandering was a conception as dim as the winter life of the swallows that came back with the spring and even a settler if he came from distant parts hardly ever ceased to be viewed with a remnant of distrust which would have pre prevented any surprise if a long course of inoffensive conducts on his part had ended in the commission of a crime especially if he had any reputation for knowledge or showed any skill in handicraft handicraft all cleverness whether in the rapid use of that difficult instrument the tongue or in some other art unfamiliar to villagers was in itself suspicious honest folk born and bred in a visible manner more mostly not over wise or clever at least not beyond much such a matter as knowing the signs of the weather and the process by which rapidity and dexterity of any kind were acquired was so wholly hidden that they partook of the nature of conjuring in this way it came to pass that those scattered linen weavers Im immigrants from the town into the country were to the last regarded as aliens by their rustic neighbors and usually contracted the eccentric habits which belong to a state of loneliness
In the early years of this century, such a line and weaver named Silas Marner worked at his vocation in a stone cottage that stood among the nutty bed, bed, head, head grow near the village of Revelo and not far from the edge of a deserted stone pit. The uh, questionable sound of Silas's loom, so unlike the natural, cheerful trotting of the winnowing win -win machine, or the simpler rhythm of the fray flail, had a half fearful fascination for the ravel of boys who would often leave off their nothing or birds nesting to peep in at, at the window of the stone cottage, counterbalancing a certain awe at the mysterious action of the loom by a pleasant sense of scornful superiority drawn from the mockery of its alternating noises along with the bent treadmill attitude of the weaver. But sometimes it happened that Mana, pausing to adjust an ir 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 irregularly in, in his tread, became aware of the small scoundrels and though chary of his time he liked the in intrusion so ill that he would descend from his loom and of opening the door would fix on on them a gaze that was always enough to make them take to their legs in terror for how was it possible to believe that the, the those large brown protuberant eyes in Silas's pale face really saw nothing very distinctly that was not close to them and not rather that their dreadful stare could dart camp or brickle rickets or a wry mouth at any boy who happened to be in the near in the rear they had perhaps heard their father's and mother's hint that Silas Manor could cure folks' uh, rheumatism if he had a mind, and add still more darkly that if you could only speak the devil fair enough, he might save you the coast of the doctor. Such strange lingering echoes of the old demon worship might perhaps even now be caught by the diligent listener among the grey-haired peasantry, for the rude mind with difficulty associates the ideas of power and benignity, a shadow con conception of power that by much persuasion can be induced to refrain from inflicting harm is the shape most easily taken by the sense of the invisible in the minds of men who have always been pressed close by primitive wants and to whom a life of hard toil had never been illuminated by any enthusiastic religious faith. To them, pain and mishap present a far uh, wider range of possibilities than gladness and enjoyment. Their imagination is almost barren of the images that feed desire and hope, but is all overgrown by recollections that are a perpetual pasture to fear. Is there anything you can fancy that you would like to eat? I once said to an old laboring man who was in his last illness and who had refused all the food his wife had offered him. No, he answered, 
I have never been used to nothing but common visual, and I can't eat that. Experience had bred no fancies in him that could arise the fan phantasm of appetite. And Ravillo uh, was a village where uh, many of the old echoes lingered in, in drowned by, by new voices. Uh, not that uh, it, it, it was one of, of those barren parishes uh, lying on the out, out, outskirts of civilization inhabited by meager sheep and thinly scattered sh shepherds on the contrary it lay in the rich central plain of what we are pleased to call Merry England, and held farms which, speaking from a spiritual point of view, paid highly desirable tithes. But it was nestled in a snug, well wooded hollow, quite an hour's journey on houseback. On horseback from any turpike where it was never reached by the vibrations of the coach horn or of public opinion it was an important looking village with, with a fine old church and large churchyard in the heart of it and two or three large brick and stone homesteads with well-walled arcades and ornamental wither, wither cocks standing close upon the road and lifting more imposing fronts than the rectory which peeped from among the trees on the other side of the churchyard. A village which showed at once the summits of its social life and told the practicized eye that there was no great park and man manor house in the vic vic vicinity, but that there were several chiefs in Ravello who could farm badly quite at their ease, drawing enough money from their bad farming in those war times to live in a roly king fashion roly king fashion and keep a jolly christmas with with sun and easter tide it was 15 years since silas manor had first come to ravello he was when simply he was then simply a pallid young man with prominent short-sighted brown eyes whose appearance would have had nothing strange for people of average culture and experience. But for the vi villagers near whom he, he had come to settle, it had mysterious uh, peculiarities with, which corresponded with the exceptional nature of his occupation and his advent from an unknown region called North Art. So had his way of life. He invited no comer to step across his door still, and he never strolled into the village to drink a pint at the rainbow or to gossip at the wheel writers. He sought no man or woman save for the purposes of his calling or in order to supply himself with necessaries and it was soon clear to the Ravillo lasses that he would never urge one of the one of them to accept him against her will quite as if he had heard them 
declare that they would never marry a dead man come to life again. The view of Mane's personality was not without another ground than his pale face and unexampled eyes. For Jim Rodney, the mole cutter averted that. One evening as he was returning homeward, he saw Silas Mana le leaning against a, uh, a style with a heavy bag on his back. Instead of resting the bag on the, the style as a man in his senses would have done, and that on coming up to him, he saw that Mana's eyes were set like a dead man's. And he spoke to him and shook him, and his limbs were stiff, and his hands clutched the bag as they'd been made of iron. But just as he had made up his mind that, he, that the weaver was dead, he came all right again, like as you might say in the winking of an eye and said good night and walked off all this gem swore he had seen more by token that it was the the very day he had been mole catching on squire cass's land down by the old soul pits some said mana must have been in a fit, a word which seemed to explain things otherwise incredible, but the argumentative Mr. Mackey, clerk of the parish, shook his head and asked if anybody was clever, was ever known to go off in a fit and not fall down. A fit was a stroke, wasn't it? And it was in the nature of a stroke to partly take away the use of a man's limbs and throw him on the parish if he'd got no children to look to. No, no, it was no stroke that would let a man stand on his legs, like a horse between the shafts, and then walk off as soon as you can say, Gee, but there might be much a thing as a man's soul being loose from his body, and going out and in, like a bird out of its nest and back. And that was how uh, folks got uh, over wise for, for they went to school in this shell less state to the, to those who would, who, who could, who could teach them more than their neighbors could learn with their five senses and the, and the person and where did master mana get his knowledge of herbs from and charms too if he liked to give them anyway or give them away jim rodney's story was no more than what might have been expected by anyone who had seen how mana had cured Sally Oates and made her sleep like a baby when her heart had been beaten enough to burst her body for two months and more while she had been under the doctor's care. He might cure more folks if he would, but he worth speaking fair if it was only to keep him from doing you a mischief. It was partly to this vague f fear that
that man was indebted, indebted for protection for protecting him from the persecution persecution that his singularities might have drawn upon him but still more to the to the fact that the old linen weaver in the neighboring par parish of Tilly being dead his hand the handicrafts made him highly welcomed settler to the richer housewives of the district and even to the more provident cottagers who had their little stock of yarn at the year's end and their sense of his usefulness would have counteracted any repugnance or suspicion which was not confirmed by a def deficiency in the quality or the tale of the cloth he wove for them and the years had rolled on without uh, producing any change in the impressions of the neighbors concerning manner except the change from novelty to habit at the end of the 15 years the the ravillo men said just the same things about cyrus manor as at the beginning they did not say them quite so often but they believed them much more strongly when they did say them there was only one important addition which the years had brought it was that master mana had laid by a fine sight of money somewhere and that he could buy up bigger men than himself but while opinion concerning him had remained nearly stationary and his daily habits had presented scarcely any visible change manners inward life had been a history and a metamorphosis as that of every fervid nature must be when it has fled or been con condemned to solitude his life before he came to ravello had been filled with the movements the mental activity had uh, and the close fellowship which in that day as in this marked the life of an arist artisan early incorporated in a narrow religious sect where the poorest layman has the chance of distinguishing himself by gifts of speech and has at the very least the weight of a silent voter in the government of his community mana was highly thought of in that little hidden world known to itself as the church assembling in latin yard he was believed to be a young man of ex exemplary life and ardent faith and a peculiar interest had been concentrated in him ever since he he had fallen at a, a prayer meeting into a mysterious rigidly and suspicion of consciousness which lasting for an hour or more had been mistaken for death to have sought a medical explanation for this phenomenon would have been held by silas himself as well as by his minister and fellow members a willful self ex exclusion from the spiritual significance that might lie therein silas was ev ev evidently a brother selected for a peculiar discipline 
and though the effort the effort to inter interpret this discipline uh, was discouraged by the absence on his part of any spiritual vision during his outward trance. Yet it was believed by himself and others that its effect was seen in an assertion of light and fervor. A less truthful man than he might have been tempted into the subsequent creation of a v vision in the form of a res resurgent memory, a less, lane, a less sane man might have believed in such a creation, but Silas was both sane and honest, though as with many honest and fervent men, culture had not defined any channels for his sense of mystery, and so it spread itself over the proper pathway of inquiry and knowledge. He had inherited from his mother some acquaintance with medi medical herbs and their preparation, a little store of wisdom which uh, she had imparted to him as a solemn bequest. But of late years he had had doubts about the lawfulness of applying this knowledge believing that herbs could have no efficiency efficacy, efficacy without uh, prayer and that prayer might suffice without herbs so that the inherited delight he had in wandering in the fields in search of foxglove and Dandelion Dan Dan and Colt's foot began to wear to him the, the character of temptation. Among the members of his church, there was one young man, a little older than himself, with whom he had long lived in such close friendship that it was the custom of their lantern yard brethren to call them David and Jonathan. The real name of the friend was William Dane, and he too was regarded as a shining instance of youthful piety. Though somewhat given to over severity towards weaker brethren and to be so dazzled by his own light as to hold himself wiser than his teachers but whatever blemish blemishes others might uh, discern in William to his friend's mind he was faultless for man uh, had one of those impossible self-doubting natures which at an unexpe unexpected age admire imperativeness and lean on contradiction. The expression of trusting simplicity in manner's face heightened by that absence of special observation that defenseless deer like gaze which belonged to large prominent eyes was strongly contrasted by the self -com complacent suppression of inward triumph that lurked in the narrow slanting eyes and compressed lips of William Dane. One of the most frequent topics of conversion, conversation between the two friends was assur assur assurance of salvation. Silas confessed that he could never arrive at anything higher than hope mingled with fear. 
and listened with loving, longing wonder when William declared that he has possessed and shaken assurance ever since. In the period of his conversion, he had dreamed that he saw the words calling the un and election sure, sending by themselves on a white page in the open Bible. Such colloquials, colloquies have occupied many a pair of pale-faced weavers, whose unurtured souls have been like young-winged things, fluttering forsaken in the twilight. It had seemed to the unsuspecting Silas that the friendship had suffered no chill, even from his formation of another attachment of a closer kind. For some months he had been engaged to a young servant woman waiting only for a little increase to their mutual savings in order to their marriage and it was a great delight to him that Sarah did not object to William's occasional presence in their Sunday interviews. It was at this point in their history that Silas's cataleptic fit occurred during the prior meeting, and amidst the various queries and expressions of interest addressed to him by his fellow members, William's suggestion alone jarred with the general sympathy towards a brother thus singled out for special dealings. He observed that to him this trance looked more like a visitation of Satan than a proof of divine favor and exhorted his friend so to see that he 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 no accursed thing with his soul silas feeling bound to accept rebuke and admonition as a brotherly office felt no re resentment but only pain at his friend's doubts concerning him and to his uh, to this was soon added some some anxiety at the perception that Sarah's manner towards him began to exhibit a strange fluctuation between uh, an effort at an increase, increased mani manifestation of regard and involuntarily signs of shrinking and dislike. He asked her if she wished to break off their engagement, but she denied this. This engagement was known to the church and had been recognized in the prayer meetings. It could not be broken off without strict investigation and Sarah could render no reason that would be sanctioned by the feeling of the community. At this time, the censure uh, the Aiken was taken dangerously ill, and being a, a childless widower, he was tended night and day by some of the, uh, the younger uh, brethren or sisters. Silas frequently took his turn in the night watching with William, the, the one relieving the, the, the other at two in the morning. The old man, contrary to expe expectation, seemed to be on the way to recovery. When one night Silas, sitting up 
by his bed bedside observed that his usually audible breathing had ceased that candle was burning low and he had to lift it to see the patient's face distinctly examination convinced him that the deacon was dead had been dead some time for the limbs were rigid silas asked himself if he had been asleep and looked at the clock it was already four in the morning how was it that william had not come in much anxiety he went to seek for help and soon there there were several friends assembled in the house the minister among them while silas went away to his work wishing he could have met william to know the reason of his non-appearance but at six o'clock as he was thinking of going to seek his friend william came and with him the minister the came to 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 summon him to lantern yard to meet the church members there and to and to his inquiry inquiry concerning the cause of the summons the only reply was you will hear nothing further was said until silas was seated in the vestry in in front of the minister with the eyes of those who to to him represented god's people fixed solemnly upon him then the minister taking out a pocket knife showed it to silas and asked him if he knew where he had left that knife silas said he did not know that uh, he had left it anywhere out of his own pocket but he was trembling at this strange interrogation he was then exhorted not to hide his sin but to confess and repent the knife had been found in the bureau by the departed dickens beside found in the place where uh, the, the little bag of church money had lain which the minister himself had seen the day before some hand had removed that bag and whose hand could it be if not that of of the of the man to whom the knife belonged for some time silas was mute with astonishment then he said god will clear me i know nothing about the knife being there or the money being gone search me and my dwelling you will find nothing but three pounds five of my own savings which william dane knows i have had these six months at this william groaned but the minister said the proof is heavy against you brother mana the money was taken in the night last past and no man was with our departed brother but you for william dane declares to us that he was hindered by sudden sickness from going to take his place as usual and you yourself said that he had not come and moreover you neglected the, the dead body i must have slept said silas 
Then after a pause, he added, or I must have had another visitation like that, which you have all seen me under, so that the, the thief must have come and gone while I was not in the body, but on but out of the body, but I say again, search me and my dwelling, for I have been nowhere else. The search was made, and it ended in William Dane's finding the, the well-known bag empty, tucked behind the chest of drawers in Silas's chamber. On this, William exhorted his friend to confess and not to hide his sin any longer. Silas turned a look of keen reproach on him and said, William, for nine years that we have gone in and out together, have you ever known me tell a lie? But God will clear me, brother, said William. How do I know what you may have done in the secret chambers of your heart to give Satan an advantage over you? Silas was still looking at his friend. Suddenly, a deep flush came over his face, and he was about to speak impetuously when he seemed checked again by some inward tuck that sent the flash back and made him tremble but at last he spoke feebly looking at william i remember now the knife was wasn't in my pocket william said i know nothing of what you mean the other persons present, however, began to inquire where Silas meant to say that the knife was, but he would give no further explanation. He only said, I am sore, sticking, I can say nothing, God will clear me. On their return to the vestry, where was further deliberation any resort to legal measures for asserting asserting the culprit was contrary to the principles of the church prosecution was held by them to be forbidden to christians even if it had been a case in which there was no scandal to the community. But they were bound to take other measures for finding out the truth. And they resolved on praying and drawing lots. This resolution can be a ground of surprise only to those who are unacquainted with that obscure religious life which has gone on the alleys of our towns. Silas knelt with his brethren, brethren relying on his own innocence being certified by immediate divine interference but feeling that there was sorrow and mourning behind for him even then that his trust in men had been cruelly bruised the lust declared that silas manner was guilty he was suddenly suspended from church membership and called upon to render up the stolen money only on confession as the sign of repentance 
could be could he be received once more within the fold of the church mana listened in silence at last when everyone arose to depart he went toward william dane and said in a voice shaken by agitation the last time i remember using my knife was when i look it out to cut a strap for you i don't remember putting it in my pocket again you stole the money and you have woven a plot to lay the sin at my door but you may prosper for at that there is no just god that governs the earth righteously but a god of lies that bears witness against the innocent there was a general shudder at this blasphemy william said meekly i leave our brethren to judge whether this is the voice of satan or not i can do nothing but pray for you silas poor manna went out with that despair in his soul that shaken trust in god and man which is little sort of madness to a loving nature in the bitterness of his wounded spirit he said to himself she will cast me off too and he reflected that if she did not believe the testimony against him her whole fate must be upset as his was to people accustomed to reason about the forms in which their religious feeling was incorporated itself it is difficult to enter into that simple and thought state of mind in which the form and the feeling have never been severed by an act of reflection we are apt to think it inevitable that a man in manas position should have begun to question the validity of an appeal to the divine judgment by drowning lots but to him this would have been an effort of independent thought such as he had never known and he must have made the effort at a moment when all his energies were turned into the anguish of disappointed fate if there is an angel who records the sorrows of men as well as their sins he knows how many and deep are the sorrows that spring from false ideas of which no man is culpable mana went home and for a whole day sat alone stunned by despair without any impulse to go to sara and attempt to win her belief in his innocence the second day he took refuge from benumbing and belie- and belief by getting into his loom and working away as usual and before many hours were passed the minister 
and one of the deacons came to him with the message from Sarah that she held her engagement to him at an end. Silas received the message mutely and then turned away from the messengers to work at his loom again. In little more than a month from that time, Sarah was married to William Dane. And not long afterwards, it was known as the brethren in Latin the art that Silas Manor had departed from the town.